There are two types of ways that we want to understand a molecular system. We want to know how it behaves at equilibrium. That is, if it is left untouched. The other question we want to ask is, what if we subject it to some change in the environment or some change in surroundings? Then what happens? If we are alive, then we're constantly changing and our environments are constantly changing. So we want to understand things out of equilibrium because that's our everyday world. I am a theoretical and computational chemist. So what we're trying to do is understand how interactions at the atomic and molecular scale give rise to properties at the human scale. Based on knowing the atomic and molecular composition and algorithms that describe how molecules behave, we use computers to facilitate the calculations as well as simulate how these millions of particles will behave under a thousand different conditions. Then we can observe it, but we like to be able to predict it. So in a sense, we can try to anticipate the unknown unknowns of, of what's going to happen to the particles that we make to solve the grand challenges of the century. And what are those grand challenges? They're in energy, they're in sustainability, they're in human health, they're in water. Uh, for example, one of the target applications is to make better metal oxides. And these metal oxides are important to convert light to power, or they're important in order to store energy and then release it later. If we get it right, we'll be able to predict better materials, better batteries. But now, can we solve those problems without creating new problems for our environment downstream? Another direction in which my research group has been actively engaged in is trying to understand how proteins are structured and how proteins change their shape. One example is a protein that is called neuropeptide Y. Uh, there's been some implications that have been found that it may affect um, the formation of aggregates in your brain that are part of Alzheimer's. And so if we could understand the binding of this peptide, we might be better be able to address how your brain is being affected by the presence of this neuropeptide Y. And so it's a great privilege to be a professor and a research scientist that on the one hand educates and on the one hand discovers. And I was privileged and fortunate to be offered the Gum Family Professor Chair. It was part of the reason why I moved here from my previous institution, uh, because uh, by moving in, into that role, it gives me a little bit of freedom to think about certain problems when I don't yet have funding for those problems to identify projects that I thought had an opportunity for, to advance science, and at the same time, to be able to increase the size of my team. And an added bonus of being the Gump family professor of chemistry is that it also linked me to a history at, at Johns Hopkins, to Thomas E. Gump and his wife, Elaine Gump. The two of them met at Hopkins they both received at least one degree from Hopkins. Ultimately, he was a PhD chemist, and I hope that through the work that I do, through the students that I train, through the work that my students do, we're doing justice to their legacy as we continue to advance chemistry.